Well, it's good to be back with you again. And this first slide that you have on the screen, if you just take a moment and look just beside that tree, between the tent and the tree, look carefully in the shadow until this little black bear emerges. Now, this is a juvenile bear that was up at camp. You can see the kids' bikes in the background there. And he or she thought it could hide from the camera person. And that is Sherry, who was pursuing this bear through the camp. Um, of course, we have since had professionals help her understand that pursuing bears can be an at-risk situation, which did not deter her, by the way. So this little bear is just silently posing and saying hello to you. Uh, this is a Lake Tahoe bear and uh, loves campgrounds, loves people. Uh, at this point, looks like a pretty sweet little bear. Um, I also, uh, in our conversation last week, um, as we're introducing Revelation to you now, that this book is God's thoughts. This is how God thinks and then conveys his thought to us. And John is called to write these things down. So what he's writing down is God's word as he's hearing it, as he's understanding it. And what I hope is that the overall theme of this book is that God is on your side. But I also said one other thing. That if you can take time to allow this first chapter to just kind of sink in and kind of create a picture for you, that it is the introduction in which the entire book hangs on. If you do Revelation without this introduction, you miss one of the vast over, overviewing themes, I guess is the word I would want to use. All right, so let's uh, jump into our first verse in verse 9, uh, second part of chapter 1. It says, I, John, your brother and fellow partaker in the tribulation and the kingdom and perseverance which are in Jesus. And remember, this is the gospel of Jesus Christ, was on the island called Patmos, because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. So what John is saying is, I'm in prison. I am on this island. I am held captive. And here I am. God is now giving me this gospel to write to you. And, and he is our brother, uh, ancient brother in time. He says, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. And I heard behind me a loud voice like the sound of a trumpet. Uh, my daughter took trumpet uh, in the school band. And uh, I have a friend who plays a trumpet, John. And what I want to say is, is that the trumpet is a beautiful instrument. So this voice has uh, a musical tone to it. Now I want to explain something to you. The word, the Lord's day that John speaks of is at the very heart of the book of Revelation. The question ultimately that the person reading the book has to answer before you get to the end of the book is who do you worship? Who do I worship? And that is the ultimate question. Because when we're talking about eternity, we are talking about the question is, who is the God of your life? Is it things man creates? Is it gods you create in your imagination? Or is there a God of the universe who sent his son, Jesus, to come and minister God's grace to us and give us a revelation of the goodness of who the Father is? So the question will be asked in chapter 13, who is this beast? Do you worship that beast in 13? There's a woman riding the beast again in chapter 17. This woman uh, subdues the beast, brings it under her control, and rides into the uh, prophetic picture, uh, do you worship the woman that is riding on that beast? And the reason I ask that is because there's two women in this book. And the women in prophecy here represent God's church. But which of those two women is the church you believe in? Then there's the innocent lamb that takes on these big monsters, these scary beasts with multiple heads and and wings and horns, uh, and it's an innocent lamb. We'll talk about that lamb. We get to meet it in, in uh, Revelation 4 and chapter 5. How do you tell the difference? And I want to say this. 
Revelation tells you which one is the one God sent. So when we look at this verse, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. John is in worship. And I'm going to go to the next slide now. And I want you to understand that this phrase has been reapplied to a different time in a different context. It's so often misinterpreted because I, I think almost everyone has heard the Lord's Day used in regards to worship. But the term the Lord's Day for John would not be what is considered the Lord's Day today. It would have been the creation Sabbath of Genesis uh, 1, 2, and 3 where God d creates the world and sets aside his Sabbath rest. So for John, the disciples, Jesus, and those living in the day John wrote this, it was their Lord's Day or the seventh day. So when the seven churches received this letter in its consecutive order, when they heard the Lord's Day, they were already celebrating and worshiping on the creation Sabbath. This makes a huge difference in the entire book. You see, it would be more than 200 years before an official change would be formalized by, and listen carefully, by both the state and the church to move the Lord's Day to Sunday, the first day of the week. It took two entities, the secular state and the church combined, and I'm going to give you two historical stories that show you how that transition took place uh, well over 200 years after the book of Revelation was entered, or written, I'm sorry. So the Lord's Day change was compatible with the pagan holiday. Now the story of Christianity, Justo L. Gonzalez, published 1984 by Harper Rowe, a church historian, listen to what he writes. In AD 34, an imperial edict ordered all soldiers to worship the supreme God on the first day of the week. It was the day on which Christians celebrated the resurrection of their Lord. But it was also the day of the unconquered sun, and therefore the pagans in Rome had no problem acknowledging the Sunday day of worship, because that was already their day. So what I want to say is that in history, already up to this point, the Lord's Day was always the creation Sabbath, celebrating the creative power of God. Constantine's edict makes a change. One year later in 325, the great assembly of the bishops that was known as the first ecumenical council gathered at Nicaea, where they again formalized the first day worship. I want to note that that assembly was called by the emperor. More than that, what I want you to understand about Constantine, though on his deathbed he professed Christ, he was actually a god, a pagan god, as a Roman emperor. And so he was, how do I want to say, a vacillating between paganism and Christianity in his entire reign up until his death. And he was willing to merge paganism and Christianity together. And this is where Gonzalez has accurately recorded his edict that he had pronounced. The Lord's Day was also again by Charlemagne, the first emperor of the Holy Roman Empire. Uh, his reign 768 to about 814 AD added another civil law to affirm the change from the seventh day to the first day of the week. So here we are now in the eighth uh, transition to the ninth century. Charlemagne once again as now the first emperor of the Holy Roman Empire. That's where pagan Rome is now becoming fully Christian Rome here. And Charlemagne is the first emperor. Notice what Gonzalo says again. As emperor, Charlemagne felt called to rule his people both in civil and ecclesiastical matters. He enacted laws ordering that there be preaching in the language of the people, that means from Latin to whatever was the local dialect, that Sunday be kept as part of worship, a day of worship and rest. And here's the big one, folks. Hang on. That the tithes for the church were to be collected when you paid your taxes. 
So when you sent in the check for the property taxes, you sent into the state your tithe money that then was transferred to the church. One of the amazing things about the book of Revelation is it is a story of the merging compatibility and power of civil religious authority at the end of time. And I'm going to tell you that in all of history, whenever religion, whenever the state merged together as co-leaders of any culture, it has always resulted in persecution and death. That those two are not to be mixed together. When it happens, it is tragic within culture and society. History has recorded it. I mean, you can go through all of the Inca empires and see again that what happened when the uh, king becomes the high priest and human sacrifice became the norm. You can see it in ancient history, even during the time of Israel. When those two forces come together, things happen that should not have happened according to God's plan. Uh, at the bottom of this slide, it says, note the change was moved from scripture to tradi tradition, in both cases by civil religious authority, not by the word of God. This becomes a major issue by chapter 14 in the final gospel invitation. And we will walk through that and show you carefully how this becomes part of the last great message to go to the entire world. Looking at verse 11 now. Continuing on, John saying, or hearing the angels say, write in a book what you see and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamon, Thyatira, Sardis, and to Philadelphia and to Laodicea. Now, we are going to also give you a presentation. I'm going to single out Smyrna and Philadelphia as the first two churches, and then we will go back and look at all seven in their sequence. But the seven churches were on an ancient mail route that started with Ephesus, and then that route, the mail would continue with a rider or runner, depending on location, and it was about uh, 24 hours between each church. So those letters would have gone systematically one after the other after the other, about a day's ride or run apart. Notice now in verse 12 and 13. Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me, and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the middle of the lampstands, I saw one like the Son of Man, clothed in a robe, reaching to the feet, girded, and girded across his chest with a golden sash. And you can see that the artist is trying to catch this vision that John saw. Notice verses 14 and 15. His head and his hair were white like wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame. His feet were burnished bronze when it has been made to glow in a furnace and his voice was like the sound of many waters. And I don't know, but I love sitting by rivers and hearing uh, waters run in a river. So I want you again to understand the voice like a trumpet, a sound like many waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, and out of his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in its strength. And I will just note the challenge of capturing the image of this vision. Uh, the artist did not have a sword, two-edged sword, coming out of his mouth. But you can understand that this is a powerful visual image that John is seeing. When I saw him, he writes, I fell at his feet like a dead man. And he placed his right hand on me saying, do not be afraid, I am the first and the last. Now, in the Greek alphabet, the first letter is the alpha and the last letter is the omega. It's like he is saying, do not be afraid, I am the alpha and the omega. And the living one in verse 18 I was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and Hades. Now let's pause here for just a moment. When we study the early history of the Christian church, we will be studying where at times there was intense 
persecution by civil authority to the church. But when you have accepted Christ, he holds the keys to defeat the power of the tomb, the grave. That's what the word Hades means, a grave. He has the power over death to offer you eternal life. And the fact that he says, I'm alive forevermore, that is the life that he has offered for all of mankind to accept eternal life. And that he holds the keys to unlock that death and transform you into eternal life. 1 John 5.11 says, he who has the Son has life. That's because he has the key to give you that gift of life that does not end. Now we're going to Revelation 1 verse 19. This slide says, therefore write the things which you have seen, the things which are, and the things which will take place after these things. We have one more verse to look at. Notice carefully. As for the mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the seven angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. Now, two things I want to point out. First of all, the word angels, agelios, is also in the Greek word, the word for messengers. It would be appropriate to read it this way. And the seven stars are the seven messengers of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. Now, the artist has correctly captured this picture. Now, I want you to think about this. Jesus is standing amidst the seven churches. So, please understand that what he is showing John is that he is an ever-present Savior with his churches on this earth, holding the messengers of those churches down through time in his hand. As an ever-present Savior, he is present with the church on earth today. I think that's a beautiful story. He is holding the messengers of his church in his hands. So this slide asks the question, do you remember who they are? Who are the messengers? I want that question just to kind of sink in before I go to the next slide. Okay? The messengers are the priesthood of all believers being held in Christ's hands. Remember in verse 6, you are the priest of his Father and his God. He says that you are the priests. He doesn't say you're going to be out there in the future. He says you are Today, priests. Priests are individuals who minister. And the word here, you all are ministers. You are all priests to his Father and God. Which means that in this picture of the church, every member of the church is called to ministry. I want you to know that in this first chapter, in verse 20, in this picture, you are safe in the hands of Jesus. There's no better place to be. Someone once said in my early development in ministry, said a really beautiful thing. God only calls you to ministry to things that are impossible for you to accomplish that can only be accomplished in the power of Jesus. Because I can't save anyone. I can't save you. You can't save someone else. But if we are in the hands of Christ and we are the recipients of his grace, then we can give his grace and his peace away to others freely. But I want you to look in this very first chapter that it's telling you you are safe in his hands. And I love how this artist has captured that picture. Um, summary. I want to walk through these two presentations we've had I just want to give you the summary of chapter 1. Because remember what my position is, that if you understand chapter 1, then the entire book will follow the theme all the way through. So uh, here's the bullet points. The first promise is a blessing by just reading the book. It doesn't say understanding the book. It says that you will be blessed by just reading the book. It tells you that his coming is near. 
It tells you that God is eternal. God's grace, God's nearness to us. Grace is the movement of God towards a human being to save them. That you receive the peace as a gift from God. That Jesus is the firstborn of the saved and all of us who are redeemed are in him. In him, he said in chapter 1, we are released from sin. Sin no longer has dominion over you. It says that his blood has washed us or atoned for all the failures. And I'm going to say that he has done that for the entire human race. It is available for every man, woman, and child, man, woman, and child on the planet. That he cleanses from all unrighteousness in that atonement. He calls you to ministry. He gave the book as a celebration of his creative power. And Christ is the ever-present Savior with us now until the very end. I mean, he told his disciples, I will never leave you nor forsake you. The question is, can you accept that promise that Christ will never leave you nor forsake you? Here we are in the midst of this pandemic. Life is all of a sudden to us very fragile, very frail. Healthy people, young people, people with medical disorders are dying. But if Jesus holds the keys to unlock death, then I would hope as Christians we can face this with no fear. Because we are in Christ Jesus, that he is ever present with us now. This introduction sets the theme for the entire book. It is everything God wants you to know about him, his church, your ministry. It's about your Christian, Christianity in action, if you would. It is about his last message of hope and his return. It is about your life of grace in him. And this book informs and prepares you for eternity. Last slide. Oregon Coast. The bottom right corner is a little family that's just over there. Uh, I don't know if they're digging for clams or just looking at tidal pools. And the fog had came in on the beach and settled in and the light was just coming up. It was just absolutely a beautiful day. And I just appreciate Sherry's ministry so much in capturing those pictures. And I find it a great joy to share them with you. So until we come together again, we are going to be looking at the seven churches Take a moment if you have time to read about Smyrna and Philadelphia. There is something rare. There is something unique about those two churches we want to talk about. Have a rich blessing.